Before we begin, we would like to acknowledge that the land where we live is part of the territory and treaty lands of the Mississaugas of the New Credit First Nation. We pay our respect to the Anishinaabe past, present, and future, as well as all of the other Indigenous peoples who call this territory home. We would also like to honour the Indigenous traditional knowledge holders who participated in the Travelling the Credit workshop series, who were so generous to share their time, energy, and knowledge with the participating youth. This podcast shares the experiences of youth and the public who participated in one of the final segments of the Travelling the Credit program in the fall of 2017. Simran, Lauren, Rhea, and Dorsa, who participated throughout the summer workshops, volunteered to lead nature walks at Meadowvale Conservation Area. The girls were really passionate about the medicinal plant knowledge they acquired from Joseph Pitiwanaquet, who founded the Creator's Garden, an Indigenous outdoor education organization. They also put a special emphasis on the importance of reconciliation between Canadians and Indigenous peoples. Okay, so before we started our tour, we just wanted to, as we said earlier, acknowledge that we are on the traditional territory of the Mississaugas of the New Credit First Nation. And, and while we're on this land, we want to be like respectful of it and make sure we're not doing anything that would harm the area that we're in or the wildlife or anything. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Yeah, we also want to care for it, and it, um, as well as acknowledge it, we want to care for it and protect it, and uh, um, work in ways that are sustainable um, for the environment and keep it going. <laughs> yeah. yeah. One thing we just wanted to realize is that all the knowledge we'll be sharing on this tour came from the workshops that we went to, so they came from those indigenous places. So all the um, knowledge about the plants came from Joe. Pitawaski, and if you want to like hear more of it from the original source, you can check out his Facebook page, uh, Creators Garden. So this is the two mat plants, and you're often probably going to see them around your house, and in, like, they're usually in groups, and they're usually planted by people. So what they do is, if a lot of people in First Nations communities, they use the seeds here, and you'll find it has like a red texture, and they'll make a drink or a tea out of it, and this often helps regulate their blood sugar levels and so in other words it helps along with them against diabetes they believe. So if you add, you can actually include your water and they say it's citrusy and makes a lemonade taste. However we've tried it and it kind of just gives off like a water down herbal tea vibe. So yeah. A lot of plants in nature kind of try to tell you what they can help you with. So, as in like they reflect your body. So like whatever the alignment is, they kind of reflect that and that's here. So, um, so let's say there's one called blood root, right? One of our personal favorites. And it's considered a woman's medicine and it's actually shaped like your reproductive organs. Okay, it's actually, so blood root is a plant that actually helps with a tumor in reproductive organs called fibroids and it, you're, uh, it's actually pretty cool because it's actually shaped like said reproductive organs and AIDS and yeah and the really cool thing is that if you actually cut the root of it it's, it kind of bleeds like this reddish inky sap which is really really neat and if you use some of that in women's medicine you use a very tiny amount because like a large amount of it would be poisonous likely. so if you use a very small amount you can use that to aid it really cool because it reflects like the idea that we were talking about that everything in nature kind of reflects how it can help what body part. Right here is Red Oyster Dogwood and what Red Oyster Dogwood does is that like we were talking earlier about how things in nature try to help show you that what they can help this actually helps with arthritis as you can see it's really flexible so it's going to be able to move in that fashion and additionally there's some white berries here these white berries poison ivy. There's swamp poison ivy and there's field poison ivy and this one helps with field poison ivy. And, yeah. and the really cool thing about both of the things that help with the poison ivy is that they grow where that poison ivy grows. So red oyster yeah. dogwood grows where the field variety of poison ivy grows, like nearby in that area. Or and um, jewelweed grows near where swamp pet poison ivy grows and it's kind of cool to see that there's flexible. This stuff has a lot of like, moisture in it too and it's really cool because it has a super um, high freezing point. Like it doesn't freeze late into the winter so 
um, Joe was telling us that like even into like negative 30 degrees weather, it's still pretty bendy because the water oh, inside okay. didn't freeze. Okay, so I'll this plant here with like the little tiny flowers is yeah. called aster or fleabane. Um, so what aster can be used for, there's a couple of different properties. Um, so one of the things that they would use it for is that aster is um, a plant that attracts a lot of deer and it is deer. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> <One second. laughs> and it's mostly because it's the last flower that's still going to be in bloom that the deers can eat after like, winter starts yeah like late november or december mm -hmm. um and so what um hunters would use it for is they would keep some um after all the aster had die out so they would kind of like dry it out and then um in like the middle of winter they would use that and burn it to then attract the deer towards them oh. because the deer would smell it and they would be attracted towards them so it's kind of used for that. And the na the reason it has the name Fleabane, do you want to explain that? Oh yeah. <laughs> and it's also because if you were, let's let's say, to burn it around an area, fleas kind of repel from said. So if you have a pet and you, you're outside and you don't have a way of like getting those away from them, yeah. you can also try to burn this and like, oh. <laughs> like when you <laughs> say around evil yeah. spirits, like just yeah. like. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> yeah they use it for like oh, even cool. horses and other pets that they have. Oh. Well, this one has my dog. Mm -hmm. like, oh, that's, that's actually a... called um, a gull. So if you open it, it's, it's a little bug house. So they actually, I don't know if it's, it's a larva inside, so there's going to be a little bug in it. Yeah. And okay, so I actually had a class the other day yeah. where my TA, um, she opened one up and she showed us the little larva inside and yeah. she said you could actually eat them. Because oh. <laughs> like, oh. people, people actually like, could eat them if you're like out in the wild or like starving or something and then you could actually eat them so she let us try it and I was like so it almost looks like this it's, a, it's an orange flower um, and it's known for its healing properties it's um, not only is it good for poison ivy but it's also mm -hmm. good for any other um, induced rashes and various types of dermatitis um, and it blooms throughout May and October and it does not thrive in direct sunlight and um, it will grow in dry places unlike poison ivy which can grow almost anywhere um and the really cool thing with Julian how it gets its name is that it's a it's super hydrophobic so water when it touches it it repels water so it gets little beads up with little jewels that's why it's called julie and the other thing with julie is its seeds um it, well it's also called the touch me knots if you guys have heard of touch me knots um so if you touch the seeds they kind of like uh the pods will like break open they kind and of like explode, explode and it feels really cool to pick them. in it and like it's a lot of fun to just go around and find yeah. all the seeds you can mm -hmm. um so yeah, yeah if we see any we'll point them out you guys yeah. can try to point them. okay it's so milkweed is what monarch butterflies often eat and it actually is considered poisonous to other animals so that's why a lot of times the monarch isn't seen as prey because if they eat the milkweed they're going to get sick and by eating the monarch you're kind of eating milkweed indirectly that's why there's actually one type of butterfly and it disguises itself to look like the monarch so it's not as prone to be yeah and the cool thing about milkweed is you can use the sap of it to help out with warts so if you have plantar warts the sap of it can help out with those and, and so with um ironwood the tree kind of twists on its way up kind of reflecting what your side would do if you had scoliosis and so the really neat thing about ironwood is that uh, unlike other trees that kind of let their needs like their, the middle go hollow as they start to get larger, ironwood sends all its nutrients to the center. It keeps that um, heartwood like really thriving of nutrients. So it's kind of pink. It's in like color. a bright pink. So when that tree is about to die is when you can use it for medicine. So when that bright pink heartwood where all the nutrients are going is going to turn black and it'll be like pencil. roughly pencil thick. And what people do is they'll cut the tree down and they'll use some of that, not even a lot. And it's usually, and they use it in their medicines that help that. Yeah, and you can use like that whole tree for like multiple different time. people and like, it's just um, really cool to bet. <laughs> if you're curious about how any of these um, medicines are in use, um, Joe has a blog, or er, like it's his Facebook page, and he yeah. posts a lot of things on there on how to use so the plants and like his oh. little lessons. So you can check that oh, out sure. if you want. Yeah, that would be yeah. great. Yeah, yeah. Okay. Uh, we'll give yeah, it to you. Yeah, yeah. Oh, yeah. See, I'm I'm a chemist, right? <laughs> so uh, I'm lo that's why I'm a, you know things that into the yeah. <laughs> but it's always just so interesting to know all this stuff. Okay, so while we're on the water. Um, 
Mississauga and the um, crisis in the indigenous communities on the reserves. Um, so in Mississauga, we were fortunate enough to have clean water. Um, and our drinking water comes from underground aquifers, which are wells or springs and or uh, surface lakes, like lakes or streams. Water is filtered and then treated to remove the harmful contaminants. And our water is filtered by our provincial governments, while the reserves water is filtered by the Indigenous and Northern Affairs Canada, so the INAC. On the reserves, most of these reserves don't have access to clean water because of either funding or problems with the plants. And um, it's important to just acknowledge this and um, raise awareness for this problem because water is a basic right. Um, we are lucky to just turn on our tap waters and drink directly from it, but most of these people on these reserves have to buy um, liters of water from bottled water, which is not even good for our environment. So um, every year we have the Great Lakes Water Walk, uh, which happens around September. Um, it happened last week, and uh, there were people in Toronto walking for this cause. And if you want more information about that, you can talk to Sue. So when First Nations people here would trade with the settlers who came, they would often promise them later on for like they'll wait the winter and let's say well let's say they were doing a deal in fall and there was they wanted something from the settlers but the settlers wanted let's say beaver pelts. Well beaver pelts aren't really that great until let's say the winter passes. So they would promise that they would buy on credit. So what they do is they promise it after they've gotten all the good pelts and then they'd give it however they'd get their resources. Yeah, and because of that, because they stuck to their word so well, they got the nickname the Good Credit Indians and that stuck around until we ended up with the Credit River. Yeah. Well, the Credit River is part of the Credit River watershed and what a watershed is, is like, a, a, it's a basin for um, precipitation and other runoff water. Mm -hmm. So um, any from the surrounding land, any water that gets runoff, it runs off into the river, the Credit River, and then which flows downward. So it starts off at, in Orangeville at the top, yeah. and it goes down to um, to the end of Lake Mississauga, and it drains out into Lake Ontario. Um, so Port Credit is kind of near the end of the water um, Credit River watershed. Mm -hmm. um, so yeah. See, in the uh, springtime, because this year there was so much water, it was actually the water came up, right? Yeah, that's a, yeah, I think so, like the levels. Yeah. So it's also very important for the watershed, um, for the water to be, for the rivers to be deep and yeah. uh, narrow instead yeah. of wide, because um, sometimes erosion from like the sides, it causes the rivers to go wider, yeah. which is actually not good because the, um, it makes mm. it uninhabitable for some species of fish and other animals that live in the water um, and uh, some of them are keystone species such as the brook trout um, and this is not good because like keystone species are important for the whole ecosystem mm. to stay stay um, healthy and um, keep it going basically um, so sometimes there's our reconciliation projects which where they put plant trees that help keep the soil rooted at the sides mm. of the rivers so that they won't like um, erode yeah. um, and uh, so keeping the river narrow keeps the waters cool and allows it for like benthic animals to like um, survive underneath mm. um, whereas if it's wider more there's more area for the sunlight to hit and make it warmer so it gets faster warmer faster the Mississaugas um, actually means um, a body of water with many mouths so that's what Mississauga means and that also shows you that um, how there's like so much water here, how it's got the rivers and the streams and stuff. Um, also, another name for the Credit River, river was Pissimiki. Yeah, it was Pissimiki. <laughs> that was like the old Pissimiki. That was like the na old name for it. For it. Yeah. And uh, I don't remember what it means. Do you guys know? The Crusting <laughs> Waters. Water. That's what it means. So once again, it's like very important for us to um, keep it clean because keep it clean and keep it healthy and keep the ecosystems that surround it healthy because it, especially because it was used for so many years by the natives um, as it was like their land and it was like what they used to, to they lived off of it basically, right? Yeah. And uh, yeah, so we should keep it like this and 
also like learn about it too because like that's very important and you can learn about the history of it. Yeah, I know it's just all oh, I heard is well, oh, this is a conservation, but then knowing the history make you appreciate a lot more. Definitely. And having to you know, have this kind of education is really helpful to pass it down to other people too. So if they know about it and know the history, you make you more aware of you know, and then try to preserve it. Yeah, it's not just you know the place. an article and it was a lot about truth and reconciliation between the people who live in Canada now and indigenous people who, yeah okay yeah because reconciliation sometimes as an individual can seem like this big giant scary thing that you're not sure like how you can actually do anything towards it because it's like, such a vast thing and you're like oh that's kind of like the government's job but this article for Canada 150 kind of highlighted the little ways that individuals can work towards reconciliation and how we can incorporate it into our lives Hi. little slips and what we're trying to do is promote truth and reconciliation between people who live here now and yeah. like so basically us yeah. and the First Nations, the Metis and like let's say the Inuit of our country. Mm. So there's little little slip and it's just like number 15 is learn the difference between Indigenous, Aboriginal, First Nation, Metis and Inuit peoples. Mm -hmm. And that's just something we want to give you each a slip at the end of the tour, and it just be like a little personal goal you can choose to follow. So yeah, yeah. sometimes the idea of reconciliation for an individual can seem really, really big and scary, and like you don't know how you can do it. So mm -hmm. this way, we thought it might be a little way to kind of get you started, okay. or just a way to think about how make a small difference. Yeah, or like mm -hmm. how individually we can work towards yeah. that, especially because it is Canada once again. Yeah. You can try to eat indig at an indigenous restaurant, cafe, or food truck. So we had the chance to have catering from a place called Nish Dish, in and that's in Toronto. So it's actually, if you want to go, it's near to Christie Pits in Koreatown, I think. Well, they have a Koreatown here? In Toronto, downtown. Oh, okay. It's at Christie. Um, okay. And it's really good food. It's awesome. <laughs> and it's an amazing way to support indigenous Nish businesses and um, projects because one of the yeah. things that Nish, like the owner of Nish, Nish is working towards is building an indigenous sector. Like you know how there's like Koreatown, Chinatown, yeah. like all those different areas like, of Toronto? Like little Italy, there's like in the yeah. day and forth, there's yeah. like little yeah. subculture -ish groups. Yeah, <laughs> so they kind of want to build a community like that for um, indigenous people in Toronto because there isn't one in there. Mm -hmm. There aren't, so they want to create an area where the business is like that would where be good. Yeah, like, yeah, like, yeah, that will also so. help the awareness as well. Right? Yeah, you have a, a place that people can go to and it's uh, mm -hmm. promoting. It's